Hello everyone, welcome to Life Questions and I'm Bill Harris, your host. We're glad you could join us today for what promises to be an informative discussion around the many questions that you, our viewers, have sent us about life's many issues. We have assigned local ministers to review your questions and they have returned with some insightful biblical answers and I'd like for you to meet these ministers right now. First up, we have Pastor Kelly Waltz of the Spencerville Trinity Church followed by Pastor Neil Whitney of the Church at Allentown, and then Pastor Ben Bizard of Auglaise Bible Church in Herod. Uh, and then uh, rounding up our panel today, we have Pastor Ted Bible of St. Mark's United Methodist Church here in Lima. We're happy to have you all with us today. And uh, we've got a bunch of questions I know that you're ready to get at. Let's get started here. Uh, this is a question I'd like to lead with. If God is real, why does he allow school shootings, world hunger, AIDS, you name it, the viewer says. There are many things in this world that seem to be from evil, not from God. How do you, how do you give perspective to a question like that? It's a legitimate question, I'd say, you know. Who wants to go for it? Go, uh, go right ahead, Pastor. Uh, yeah, when you think about the way the question's worded. It's not worded about natural disasters or anything of that nature. It's all of things where people make choices. And it takes me back to Genesis in the beginning there where God creates everything and then man sins. And everything evil seems to come from that. Even Christ himself, when asked the question about washing his, his disciples' hands, his comment is, it's not the things on the outside that defile a man, it's the things from mm -hmm. the heart. Mm -hmm. And so, so many of these things they're coming from the human heart and for us as sinners. And so these kinds of things, it's not that the Lord authors those things, it's that we do evil and it comes from our, our sinful nature. Very good answer, very good answer. Go ahead, Pastor. Going along with that, God is not mocked. Be ye not deceived as you sow, so shall you reap. Mm -hmm. So you can usually look at a situation and discover why that happened. It either happened because I did something wrong or somebody else did something wrong or I believe that original sin is another cause of, uh, of evil in the world that introduced evil to the world. Yeah. God didn't create evil, no way. Evil is the absence of good. We have free will, and unfortunately, we live in a community where we're affected by those around us and by ourselves. Whenever, I, whenever everything goes wrong with me, I always go to the mirror first. Mm -hmm. Go to the mirror first and then look around after that. Yeah. That's good. Go ahead, Pastor Kelly. But then I think, you know, we do have free will. People make choices. We have no control over the consequences of our choices. And um, it's been that way ever since the beginning. But we also have to know that our God is a loving God. And even in the midst of the choices that we make and the consequences of what's going to happen, God is still at work. And it's whether it's good, whether it's bad, we have to put our faith and trust in him that some good will come out of a bad situation. And oftentimes then it's how do we respond? We can complain and be sad and carry on about how terrible, how terrible, how terrible. But then how are we going to respond in a positive way mm -hmm that maybe God can work through us to make the difference in a life of somebody that's within our own community where something like a shooting could be avoided. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, we can talk and we can pl complain all we want to about things that have happened, but what can we ourselves do to make sure that God can work through us, but also shed light on how God can is still working in the midst of even all this evil that is happening in the world. Yeah. You know, there's an old saying that I, I, I've often used myself is, what happens in the home ultimately affects society. How much can we look to the home for being uh, the nucleus of some of these problems? What, what would you say, Pastor Bible? Yeah, I think we can look at the home in, in so many different ways as being a, being a place where many, much of this is rooted. Um, the home is a place where good is rooted, as well as sometimes evil, you know, and, and so when we look at homes and we look at children being raised in homes, well, you know, with, without parents or without, you know, single parent households, 
all these different kinds of complications that, that, that take, take place where, where parents are more selfish, more self-centered, rather than being caring for their children. You know, you know, as pastors, we run into this kind of thing. We hear about these situations, but everybody hears about these, you know, and they look upon those situations and, and wish it was something different. You know, that's where we go back to the free will. With free will comes some wonderful opportunities. With free will comes some horrible <laughs> consequences. Yeah. And so this question deals with the horrible consequences. You know, we, you know, God did not want his people to be robots. You know, right. you do this, you do this, and just go kind of, you know, moving us through a game show kind of thing, <laughs> mentality. Mm -hmm. That's not who we are, you know. And so with that comes poor choices and consequences that are just horrifying to us and to God. Yeah. Yeah. And when we, when we look at the role models we have in the home, you know, and the father, I would think, being a primary one, supposedly the leader, the mom, uh, there alongside the husband, and, and they basically on a platform performing the way they were taught when they were kids and from their parents, and it goes back and back and back to all these previous generations until somebody decides we're going to make a change here, a generational change here. Isn't that a, a part of the issue, too, that uh, we've got to stop this cycle somewhere along the line so that, because this country is really spinning out of control even, even now on so many different fronts. Well, I, I think, too, you know, you're, you're spot on with that, but I think additionally, you know, money and power drive so many decisions in this world, and money and power is evil. <laughs> you know, it leads to evil decisions, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, we talk about the, the evil of gun violence, but yet you can, you can watch multiple evil movies involving gun violence and video games and all that kind of thing, but yet that seems to be okay. Why? Because there's power and there's money associated with that. You know, and so the same thing goes with so many different aspects of that. You know, follow the money, gambling, legalized, whatever. It's all about... When I was a kid, it was outlawed. Yeah, exactly. You know. But now if, there's, if we can tax it, it evidently is okay. That's what happens. It's, 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 and it's, it's evil. It's revenue. Well, but, yet, but if we can generate revenue off of it, then I guess yeah. we'll accept it because yeah. we've, a, we've agreed that we can't change it. Yeah. So let's just make some money off of there's, it. There's a two-sided mentality about... Government sometimes, I think, you know, if it moves, regulate it. If it stops, tax it. <laughs> I mean, the reality that, that we say gambling's okay, and let's put all this extra money aside for counseling for gamblers. See there? I mean, that's just insane. Yeah, yeah. Insane. See? You know. I think it makes me think of Romans chapter 1, where they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. And so God says, well, here, go to it. You know, sometimes as a parent, your kids, I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. Okay, well, let's watch what happens. I know what's about to happen. You want to go ahead and do that, we'll, we'll see. And it's almost like we want, as creatures, we want our own way and we want to worship ourselves. And so God says, okay, well, let's see what happens when you worship yourselves. Well, I'm going to go off the script here a little bit with another question. There's a move in front uh, that would try to take control away from parents on issues, and, and one of them being sex changes. If a child wants to have a sex change, that that child should be allowed to do so without having to have the consent of the parents. Um, is that along the lines of what we're talking about, too? Uh, is that a matter of rejecting who God made you in the first place when you want to do that? And I think that's probably a large part of it. I mean, we want life on our terms. Uh, we want God to, to conform to what we think and what we want. And God didn't make a mistake. I mean, when it comes right down to it, God knew when we were born. He knew what we were going to be. He knew all of that. Even before? He didn't make a, yeah, uh, Jeremiah. Yes. It says, even before I knew you in the womb. So it, the idea is that God knew what he was doing. And he didn't make a mistake. And so I, I think that's part of it. We reject what he's done in our creation. Mm. The rest of you, you have any comments on that? Or you want to remain silent? I think the same thing that? goes in regards to abortion where, you know, parents have been taken, in some states, parents are being taken out of that equation and letting the younger child, yeah. the child, <laughs> make that decision. Parents need to be involved in making those decisions, mm. you know. Otherwise, every, every kid should be able to drink when they're 12, right? Because, 
<laughs> if they seem to know best about those things, they yeah. shouldn't be able to make that kind of decision too. Well, uh, you know, right? a parent so, would not allow a child to decide about their education. That parent's just going to say, you will go to school, you'll take this course, that course, and the other because they know how important, I mean, that's, a, that's an important issue. But to allow a child to do some of the other things that we're allowing them to do now, with, even without parental consent in some areas, is, is getting out of hand, I think, yeah. yeah. Well, I think sometimes uh, parents get confused on what their role is. You know, we have a loving uh, God, but uh, if we make uh, bad choices, there could be consequences to those choices. There could be discipline. And so many of your parents today, they want to be the best friend to their kids. Yeah. And they're forgetting about what their role is. You have to set boundaries up for your children in in order for them to grow up so that they'll make good choices. But if all you want to do is be their best friend, then you're going to, uh, you know, be the parent that gives them whatever they want yeah. and you don't want to say no to them. And um, that's not, that's not the kind of parents I was raised with. And um, because kids are young, their brains are still forming they can't make necessarily the best decisions yeah. for themselves. Their bodies are still forming right, while the brains right. are still forming. And then well. part of the, you know, they want to be the best friends or parents just aren't, because of the environment they may have grown up in, they don't know how to go about raising their kids in such a way that they'll make better decisions mm -hmm. because they didn't have parents that demonstrated that for yeah. them. So we've got... Uh, I, I want to ask another question, another follow-up question on this, but I think we'll wait till after the break right now. We want to continue on this vein, and I've got another question that's along these same lines from another viewer. We'll get into that as well, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Thank you for staying with us. Okay, we're back with uh, Pastor Neil. You want to follow up on what Pastor Kelly was saying? Yeah, basically, I just, whenever I have a real important decision to make, I want to ask a very mature, learned, educated person. And uh, children don't qualify for that. So I would just um, not allow somebody to make a decision that wasn't qualified to do it. We mm -hmm. don't do that in any other area of life. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. This is another question that came up. It's somewhat related. Uh, my pastor tells me I should not live with my boyfriend before I get married, but I really don't understand why. This is a, this is a question from a viewer. I did not grow up in church. I am now interested in church, but the pastor says I have to move out of my boyfriend's apartment because living together is a sin. There's no question really attached to this statement here, but I guess the question would be, to put this in perspective, why is this wrong? Why is this pastor asking her to move out of the apartment uh, with a boyfriend? Why, why all of that? Who, who wants to start on that first? Okay, so I'll, I'll dive in. Um, it, is, it, is, it is a sin. You know, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, as pastors, we shouldn't permit that, encourage it. Um, I, I also, I mean, my, my perspective, I've been a pastor for seven years, so my perspective on marriage today and doing marriage ceremonies is different than it was a few years ago. I don't do that many wedding ceremonies. Um, part of the reason is, is that when somebody calls, calls the church and says, hey, you know, we'd like to get married in your church, I, I ask them, I say, so where do, where do you go to church at? Well, typically the answer is, I don't. I said, well, before we have the conversation about you getting married here, you need to come in and visit our church a few times because you have no idea what I do, <laughs> you know, how I handle myself, what our church is like. You know, your wedding day shouldn't be the first time that you walk into our building, right? And so 
that usually ends the conversation and they never call back. If they do, then they need to attend church for a while because my, my primary goal is for the person to come into a relationship with Christ. You know, if they're, if they're living together, th that's not ideal, but I also don't want to be the guy who, who breaks off a relationship with Christ. I want the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. and that's something I can't do, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not as hung up on that as what some pastors would be, and that's not a criticism to anybody. It's just kind of like, I'm, in, I'm looking at the long term, and I want them to fall in love with the church and fall in love with Christ, and I don't want to be the one to kind of stand in the way of that. So I don't like the, I don't like the, I don't like having to tell somebody that. I haven't told somebody that. I would never criticize somebody for doing that. I would rather them not live that way, but I'm in the long game. And so that's kind of where I'm at with that, with that situation. You're shaking your head. Um, yeah, it, I'm thinking, okay, that's a sin. And he's saying, if you don't stop sinning that way, you can't come to church. So if we say, okay, if you're sinning, you can't come to church, then who's going to be at church? Because we're all sinners. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, I have found that as people grow in their relationship with the Lord and draw closer, then it's like our behavior starts to change as well. And we start to make choices that are going to um, eliminate sin because we're going to realize, oh, that TV show we used to love to watch that is great. Now I've grown as a Christian and I realize that really does, doesn't sit well with me. And the spirit is saying, no, no, no. And you stop watching that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some of that that's in your life that is not good that has been eliminated. Yeah. Do I growth. want somebody to come and tell me, well, you can't come to church because what you've been choosing to watch on TV goes against God's word. So you better stay out. And it's like we're all sinners. We all have things that we need to work on. And it's as we love the person, but not the sin, mm -hmm. that we build that relationship and then help them grow in their relationship with the Lord, that they come to realize, I need to stop doing this. I need to stop doing this because this just doesn't set well with the spirit in me. Mm -hmm. And it's a journey. It's a process. But Yeah, the other thing I tell people, in, is, and, 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 and the statistics prove it, is that you know if, if Christ isn't in your marriage, your marriage is going to fail. And I just tell them that right up front, you know. And so I don't want to be a part of a marriage where you're not well willing to welcome Christ into that. Mm -hmm. That means coming to church, whether it's my church or somebody else's church. You can need to be involved in church. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to make. This is not the venue where we show off because we have a pretty sanctuary and this is where people get married at. We're not a wedding venue. <laughs> We're not in that for the money. We're in for the relationship with Christ. We've got an opportunity so. for God to work through us in that person's life. And then if we say the judgment, uh, <clears throat> you got to stop doing it. Is that how really God wanted to work through us to change their life? By saying you can't come unless you make this change. Go ahead, Pastor Ben. I think to part of this, um, it is a sin. And it, and giving the value of what marriage is. I mean, we do devalue what marriage is in our society. It's you, you live together in order to, to find out if you're compatible or, or those kind of things. But the value of marriage, I, I think of several passages in the scripture uh, talking about Malachi is one of them that, that came to mind for me. Malachi chapter 2 where he talks about it being a covenant. Mm -hmm. And that marriage is something that we don't look at it as a covenant that we're making with God of what we promise to do. And I think that's part of it is that, that we've devalued what, what marriage really is and the importance of it. So people go to that position and, and, and that becomes kind of the way people live. And from my perspective, I can understand exactly what the pastor is doing here by saying, listen, this is something you need to, to take care of. I actually know of a story where a, a missionary was on the field and this had happened and they got saved and the husband moved out or the, the father, they had kids. He moved out the, like a week later, the pastor married them. Um, but he showed a willingness that, you know what, like, I can see the problem with this. 
and was willing to, to do something like that. Mm. So it, it does go back to the heart. If it's, well, I, this is what I like, this is what I want, the hard part of that is you'll carry that into your marriage, you'll carry that into the future, and just being able to say, listen, if this is the wrong thing, maybe I should pump the brakes on that, mm -hmm. and, and really asking what's my heart about this issue. Pastor Neal? She said she did not grow up in church. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. So that, you mentioned perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's your number one thing is she did not grow up in church. But it says, I'm interested in going church to now. church. Praise God, the Holy Spirit's working in her yeah, life. Yeah. So you talked about discipleship earlier. So this is a perfect discipleship opportunity. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So how should that unfold? What would that look like then? Conversation and questions to get inside of their minds to find out where they both are. And more importantly, where they want to be in the future. So it's just a discipleship opportunity. Yeah. You know, I think whether it's this issue or other ones, you know, too often, you know, um, people are just, I want a little bit of Jesus. I don't want a lot of him because I can't handle all of him. I want to pick and choose which things I want to, I want to believe in, which rules and which teachings I want to follow. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, you, you, you know it, it's either you need all of him, you know, and sometimes, many times, <laughs> when you take all of him, it's hard. It hurts. You have to give up certain things that you feel very comfortable with or you have in the past or other people will like question you as to why you're doing that. But again, do you want the full blessing of Christ or you just want a little bit of it? Mm -hmm. And so there's hard decisions to make with that. And this is one of her first hard decisions that she's going to have to make as she continues her journey of faith. Well, that's why discipleship is so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you, you celebrate them when they give their life over and then Sometimes you leave them hanging. Okay, you're on your own. Sometimes you help them along the way. But really, it's about doing life to the point that um, you're walking with them through whether it's messy or great or whatever. But then they get to the point that they don't really need you walking with them because they come to understand that Jesus is right there with them, walking with them every step of the way. And so then they've made Jesus their best friend to be the go-to that's going to guide them in the way that they have to go. But we don't walk long enough with people for that to be established. We let them go early because we give them a little bit and think, okay, we've given them a little bit. They're going to be fine. And so. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Here is um, another question we have from a viewer. A friend of mine recently told me she talks to God like a friend. I don't understand how to do this. I pray before meals and I pray with my children at bedtime, but I don't understand what it means to talk to God like a friend. And so I guess she's un asking for an understanding of what that's like. How do, how do you do that? You've got a big smile on your face, Pastor yeah, well, Neil. A very long time ago, a young man came to me and he said, I... I don't, I don't get this God thing, but I get this Jesus thing. Oh, really? So Jesus is your best friend, the Bible tells us that. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand God, the best place to start is Jesus. And to understand that Jesus is your friend. He's a real person that you can talk to. So that would be my first suggestion, get to know Jesus better. Very good, very good. Yeah, one of the things that, that this person says is that they, they pray before meals and they pray with their children at bedtime. I'm going to make an assumption here, and I could certainly be wrong, that those prayers could also be then like, you know, standard kind of prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep mm -hmm. or, you know, God is great, God is good, now we thank Him for our food. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a conversational kind of prayer. Mm -hmm. and so if you're only doing it at over at meals and at bedtime, then there's a lot of other time throughout the day that we need to inject prayer in our life. Mm -hmm. And that's when we have a conversation with God. And in some ways, she's probably having, he or she's having those conversations and doesn't know it already. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when life's difficulties and challenges come upon us, you know, we're calling out to God for guidance and direction. And, and when we can't do it, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit does it on our behalf, yes. right? And so, I think she just needs to incorporate more time 
deliberate time, you know, when, 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 they're, when they're out walking or jogging or driving from here to there mm -hmm. or doing whatever, set aside additional time besides these two times because, you know, those are just prayers for the food and those are prayers for the children before mm -hmm. they bed. Where's that person's opportunity to, to share with God what's on their mind and what they're seeking for guidance and direction in life? I think to think of it like a conversation. Whenever it comes to friends, you don't just talk to them every once in a while. You yeah. carry on a conversation, you get to know them. And I know at first we think prayer has to be a specific way. We're going to pray like this. And, and it made me think of some of the people in the Bible. Um, Daniel, his prayer in chapter 9, where he, he's praying to God about all the things that have happened, but you can sense that this has been a lifelong thing for him. He hasn't just started doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I'd encourage a person to not just be praying in those moments, but kind of like what you were saying, pray often, treat it as a conversation. It, talking to the Lord is not something we do just once in a while. And if you only talk to your friend once in a while, well, then it, it's not going to feel that way. When you get to talk to him often throughout the day about several things, mm -hmm. then it helps to be able to do that. So most as if, okay, my best friend's not available right now, the one that you would talk to, uh -huh. so let me just go ahead and unleash everything to you, Lord, and um, as if you were talking to them because, and that's key, you know, my best friend, I wouldn't have opened up 10 minutes after I knew her or 20 minutes after or even a week. It was a matter of time and in the beginning you shouldn't beat yourself up because you're only doing the quick little short because it may feel uncomfortable just like it would feel uncomfortable opening up and sharing everything with somebody that you just met mm -hmm. but as you become to trust them more and more you open up even more and you know one of the things i did was i journaled a lot so a lot of my prayers are written down conversations that I am talking to God as I'm writing things down. And that okay. served to be easy for me. Very good. And on that note, we'll, we'll just cap it off right there. Thank you very much. We certainly appreciate all the contributions you've made. And pray that uh, God will continue to bless you all as well. That's it for today. We will be back again next week at this same time. Until then, God bless you for now. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.